sales enablement. I don't know if it's atypical or not, but I've been in tech sales with Microsoft, Intuit, a number of companies way before I was in enablement. And I went from being a sales director to a sales enablement director after a one-on-one -on -one with my EVP of sales, and he gave me the weekend to think about it. This was 10 years ago this month. And so in that case, certainly there was nothing to inherit. I had to figure it all out. Um, then I got recruited to go work for Vonage, ran their global enablement for three years. And again, my current boss, I've worked for previously as a sales leader, he brought me over to Instructure three years ago. Um, my point being, everywhere I've gone, there were sometimes sales training functions, and you all know the difference between training and enablement, um, but there has never been enablement uh, that I could inherit and build on. And I don't say that to brag, it's just I had to come up with a framework pretty quickly. Now, what we're gonna walk through today is the transformation that my team and I have put in place over the last three years in Instructure, and just understand that this is the latest iteration. Now, the cool thing is, and I'll be pointing this out, with Saleshood the last two years, I've been able to add things to this framework that I, I knew I wanted to do before, but there was no really good technology or way to do it. So let's jump in. The uh, first thing I want to acknowledge is the team. Our team is capitalized for a reason. Long story, but that is how they refer to themselves. And it has to do with an interaction, indirect interaction we had with Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray. And so he is our patron saint. I can tell you that story at the reception tonight. I just My point is, I'm up on stage today. They couldn't all be here, but it's not about me. This is, this is a, one of the greatest groups of enablement folks I've worked with ever. So what I want to go through with you today, at a very high level, you can see, I won't read them all, but revenue, impact, enablement. So Henny alluded to it. I know others are going to allude to it, but I just can't, I don't think we could emphasize it enough if it was in all five sessions today. Look at where we've been. A year ago, we were all worried about hanging on to our, our, our talent. Anybody besides me had their, had their enablement team getting recruited all the time for silly money, right? That was a year ago, January even. Now, what are you seeing on LinkedIn? Not to be a, a downer, but enablement teams can be an easy target for the spreadsheet jockeys. The key to not having that happen, or at least not happening very easily, is being able to correlate back to revenue. So I'm sure you're gonna hear variations of this all through the day. I'll give you my, my flavor of it. Um, Eli, I talked this morning about sales enablement to revenue. I don't know why I'm looking at the screen. I've got a monitor. Um, revenue enablement. When I was asked, because I didn't know anything, when I was asked to go and figure this out for a company called In Contact, um, I just made sense to me that our CS teams, at the time it was just methodology, but our CS teams should be enabled the same methodology as our salespeople and our SDRs and our SEs so that you had continuity in the customer experience. Penny talked about same language, common language, and it was critical. So I didn't know what it was called, but I, one of the things, I didn't get everything right, but one of the things I learned early is all customer, I call it customer journey enablement, and all of the teams should be together. I'm going to talk about methodology. Um, we're going to talk about pathways, and let's just jump in. So this is probably not news to anybody here. When you are starting or revamping a, a sales transformation, if you don't know what you're trying to do, it's really hard to get direction. Now, this has been modified. This is what a variation of these two vision statement and mission statement I came up with when I first got to Instructure with my CRO. We revamped this as a team in our offsite about a year ago, especially the mission statement. We are an ed tech company. We sell a little bit to business, but only corporations that have an internal university structure. And so that's why the team felt it was important that we get in the, the you know, elevating teaching and amplifying learning and all of that. And, and if you're wondering what Pan University is, I meant to mention that is our internal brand. And that's something else that I have found very useful when you're doing something like this. Come up with a brand, something that is an umbrella for all of your enablement, and something that people can identify with, right? It just, there's a lot of power in it. Now, our informal mascot is a panda. Therefore, here, Panda University, at Vonage it was Vonage U, but we didn't have a mascot, so it was a lot more fun to build this logo. 
And then when you have your mission and your vision down, now you need to set strategy. The technique that I use is not mine. It comes from two authors, Kaplan and Norton, Harvard Business Press. The book is called The Strategy-Focused Organization. Now, I'll warn you, it's very long and very dry, um, and it's really focused on how to do strategy mapping for the enterprise. The trick was learning how to scale it down for what the authors call a share, internal shared service unit, which is where enablement fits the most comfortably. And I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go into a ton of detail. This is actually the latest map that my team and I were together in Park City two weeks ago. This is our map. Uh, these are designed to run 18 to 24 months. And the point here is it's very high level thinking, 18 to 24 months. How are we going to do things? How do, how do we, what are our customers looking for from us? How are we gonna differentiate? And once that's mapped out, I don't have, I'm gonna say I'm happy to talk to any of you offline on this, but I will tell you this, this speaks to executives. This strategy mapping concept has been around since the late 90s. What I found is a lot of the executives that I work with that have been through MBA school or even just business school have encountered this. Even if they haven't, what I found is this meets them where they live. The key is before you do any mapping, you agree with your head sales leader, whoever that is, what are the three financial metrics, revenue metrics, that enablement can influence? With that agreement in place, then you build a strategy, and you'll notice it's a little, little convoluted, but everything on there flows back up to at least one of those revenue goals. And where this can be really helpful in talking to executives is when you're asking for investment. So two years ago, probably right around now, I wanted to make some significant investments in our tech stack. One of them was saleshood and selling through curiosity. When I pitched my boss, the CRO on it, he already knew about this, he'd already bought into the map, and so my presentation went something like this, Frank, here's use cases in saleshood, here's what, they're, what they do, and here is the element or elements of our strategy map that they will drive it just made a much easier conversation. So that's just one example of how I found that useful. Now let's talk about framework. Again, this is the latest culmination of evolution of my thinking. Um, and as I said before, having technology finally that can let me do some of the things that I could only think about previously. At a really high level, this is how I look at the life cycle of, and I'm focusing on sales for this. I have a version of this for CS, for SDR. I'm gonna just focus on sales for right now. I believe that enablement should have a voice in the hiring process. Not that we're interviewing, but there's work that we can do to inform those that do interview, especially in the recruiting department, to make sure we're bringing in the right level of candidate. One of the members of my team, Caden, he came to us as an intern and made himself invaluable, so he's running our onboarding now two years later. But the first thing he did was work with all of our sales, CS, and SDR leaders and developed hiring profiles for success and created battle cards for our recruiters. So we have a place there. But once those folks are in the door, I look at them as new hire, which I think speaks for itself, conversant, which to me means they are not completely independent, but they are comfortable having conversations with customers and they're not skiing past their tips. But we ultimately need to get them to full proficiency so that they are using their sales leader and their sales in, uh, engineer in appropriate proportion. And they're very confident on running the sales process as much as we need them to. And the last piece, and again, Penny, you, you have so many great entry points for me, uh, is, is, what is what is next in their career? We have a role in helping prepare our sellers, our sales leaders, our CS team for their next role. Once they're proficient, once they're consistently successful, what are the experiences that we can offer them? We, for our SDRs, we also have pathways specific to AEs. For other, other groups, it's maybe not quite as crisply defined, we're still working on that, but we are offering them that opportunity Let's go back to revenue having impact on the organization. How expensive is it to turn a salesperson, even a mid-market AE? I don't know the numbers offhand, but I know it's in the hundreds of thousands. And so by doing this 
and helping retain talent and help preparing them for their next role at the company, or at least that people feel like they're being developed for that next role is another opportunity for enablement to really have impact and be seen as more than just a training organization. So I'm gonna take just a couple minutes and dive into a couple of the elements following this framework. So in that hiring process, I already talked about the profile for success battle cards that Caden created for um, our recruiters to use. I showed you, oh, I've, one thing I did want to mention on this, the other three elements that are going to tie into the next couple slides are the three pillars, I suppose. I think uh, somebody's already used that, Eli. But three, uh, three key elements of any strong enablement program. One is methodology. I have found that methodology, and by that global, custom to your business, methodology is so critical and frankly such a big lift and ongoing project that it gets its own path, own way of thinking about things. Uh, beyond that, then we have product and skills training. And then finally, tools and assets. And you notice like, I lump them together because some of them are technology tools, some of them are assets, tools, battle cards, competitive dashboards, things like that, that we're going to provide for them. And you can see here at a high level how I think about these things for each of the three stages in that salesperson's development. Now we can dive in. So, when someone's new, and again, I can only speak to my experience, it's hard, actually I think you mentioned this too, it's hard to really give them the full methodology works all at once when they're new. I found they really need some time in seat, figure out where things are, we're teaching them some of this in onboarding, but then some of it is just them being able to get comfortable in their role, comfortable in their new skin. And then we're in a better position. But we don't want people to have to wait until the next cohort, which may not be, right now with Selling Through Curiosity, we're down, well, we are having to be doing two back-to-back -back right now, but we're typically only needing to run them every six months uh, because everything's been in place for a while. We don't want that person to wait six to nine months, depending on when they came in, so we have a basics, essentials, I guess is a better word to call it, so that they understand the elements of selling through curiosity, so that when they hear terms like mutual plan, they don't feel dumb. They know what everybody's talking about, and they start to get comfortable. We, you know, things like, all, again, if you use selling through curiosity, some of this will make sense, layering questions, probing questions, quantifying questions, just the sorts of things that let them at least participate somewhat in the conversations within their teams. Uh, some of the, I'm not going to go over all of these. Some of these have been mentioned before. Specific onboarding pathways by role. And because we're an international company, we even have them by region. Because the way that we sell in developing parts of APAC is not how we sell in North America, which is where 75% of our business comes from. Very, very different. We have 60, 65 or so percent of the higher ed market in North America. We're still having countries in APAC that we're introducing ourselves, right? So, so it's just very different. And so you have development pathways that reflect that difference. The other thing that we're using is the pathways and the huddles in saleshood. And this is where I get excited about the technology piece. I've, we, my teams and I have built pathways before for onboarding and professional development, everboarding, some people call it. That's not new but being able to track it in a way that we can correlate back to metrics in saleshood, or excuse me, Salesforce, that's new, or at least new for me as of two years ago. How do you go about getting that in place? Well, number one, you start with your sales managers. We don't want to, there's so many things we can measure in enablement, and measuring things that they don't care about might be useful for internal, for our work, but we generally want to build a correlations dashboard that's going to speak to our sales leaders. So here are a couple of examples. Folks that have gone through selling through curiosity, we expect to have a higher percentage of their opportunities have multiple products in them. Has anybody here tried to, had to go through that transformation process of single product sale to platform sale? Anybody, yeah, and it's hard because people sell what they're comfortable with. So we expect selling through curiosity because of what we teach them to help with that. So that's one of the things we measure. For someone like an SDR, we're going to look at What's their first time, excuse me, when, what's their time to first sales qualified lead, sales qualified lead to close business, that sort of thing. 
But we worked with our sales and SDR leaders to determine what those metrics were to track back. And that's a big deal for us. Canvas, if you're wondering, is our core product, which is our LMS. So we do use, we, we believe in eating our, you know, drinking our champagne, I guess I should say. Uh, and, and so that is our LMS. But, but that's fine. We can still tie the work that people are doing back to saleshood when we do use Canvas. And we also have all of their development tracks are still in saleshood. And Structure 360, I'll get, actually, I'll get more into that on another slide, uh, but that is our content portal. So now we have somebody that's conversant. They're doing all right. They're not terrified to pick up the phone. But what are we doing for them that we're doing differently than when they were brand new? And for us, by the way, brand new can range from a week to three weeks because one of the big changes, transformations we made for this year with our sales leader support is a fully immersive onboarding experience. No quota, no access in Salesforce to your future accounts. Because we determined with those leaders the previous year or two that we were just, we were actually setting up our salespeople, especially to fail. Because here we're saying, okay, invest in yourself. This is your chance to onboard. It's only going to get more difficult the deeper you get into your job and your territory. Yet they had a quota. It was a baby quota, but nonetheless, someone was asking them about it. They had accounts. And I'll give you, a, this is the one event that really was the tipping point for a couple of our sales leaders and myself where we realized it's time to really push for this immersive experience. It was last September, I think that a year ago that we had, uh, I don't remember if he was a, an enterprise level or mid-market level rep, but was sitting in onboarding with HR and IET, right? This is like day zero. They're teaching them how to log into their email and the systems. This poor individual logged into their email and had whoop, customer escalations. I mean, this is your first morning on the new job. What kind of experience is that? And that was, it's unfortunate that had to happen to that person, that was our tipping point. So because they're fully immersed, because that is their only job, they don't report to enablement, but they dotted line to Kim Davis and her team, who are the piece of my team that handle all of the onboarding professional development. That's why we can get it down to one week for SDRs, three weeks for full quota carriers, because we, I don't wanna say we own them, but we kinda do, so. Um, but it's with the full support of our sales leaders. Every one of them acknowledge Whatever little bit of quota they might have been building up and pipeline those first three weeks, they would trade that in a heartbeat for someone who was fully certified in pitch, fully certified in demo, and you know all the rest. Um, I don't know if they're, yeah, we'll go ahead to the next one. So proficient reps are tough, aren't they? And a lot of reps think they're proficient before they are. That's another story. But when they are proficient and they're successful, it's difficult to get their attention, right? Anybody want to, yeah. Changed my mind. Um, and we found it was particularly true coming out of 2020. It's not something we talk about. And I know we've got uh, some friends from Power School here, right? I'm sure you all experienced the same kind of thing. 2020 in EdTech was a windfall year for horrible, horrible reasons. But the point is, our inbound, outbound SDRs all became inbound SDRs for several months in 2020. Now, why do I mention that? Because from an enabling standpoint, our job just got a lot tougher. And as my boss put it, in a tornado, even turkeys appear to fly well. All of a sudden, everybody is a sales rock star. Everybody thinks they've cracked the code. Okay, well, coming in to late 21, I think it's probably by the time, that, um, they started to find out, hmm, maybe there's still something I can learn. But it, just, it was just another layer of us dealing with Perception, reps that had the perception they're proficient versus those that are. So what are we doing differently for them? You notice that we are a Tableau shop, if you look at product and skills training, and we are big believers in using the data that comes. Our RevOps team is truly world-class. They've built a view in Tableau that they call the one ring, and it really is. Um, you can go in there and you can pivot and filter on anything you want to measure that's going on within our sales organization, Africa Revenue Organization. And we take great advantage of that to help inform not just what do the sales leaders think we need, I think we all deal with that, but also where is the best opportunity for impact. So we really love having access to that data. The other place that we 
are able to help the proficient rep, and although they didn't realize this at first, is giving them a standard methodology. When my boss got there in August of 19, there was no single sales leader globally. Each region, each piece of the business had a separate sales leader, they did their own thing. Having everybody under one methodology, having everybody under was his goal. And at first, of course, the, you know, the reps that are doing well kind of pushed back. But then we started having the classes and the workshops. And if you haven't seen how Selling Through Curiosity, they started developing a online uh, asynchronous synchronous learning model, like a flipped model. I think, what, maybe like five years ago? It was not a knee-jerk reaction to COVID. And it shows. And even our best salespeople by the second or third session started contributing. And we actually get very high survey results on it. So the proficient reps didn't realize it at first, but they found that they actually could learn, they could use something. Um, why we're doing something through curiosity is a longer story than I have to tell right now. Happy to share that because I didn't grow up with it. I used a different well-known methodology that I learned as a Microsoft leader and carried through my career up until I got to Instructure. And I decided that as great as it was, I'd taught it all over the world, I'd customized it, it wasn't right for ed tech sales. Um, the other area that we have been able to impact proficient sellers is what you see we call in Structure 360. Lisa on my team is our knowledge, our revenue knowledge content strategist. She has built a portal that offers a truly customized experience for salespeople. When they log in, we moved our newsletter online. It's no longer uh, you know, sent out an email and all that. Um, and you only see what uh, pertains to you as a salesperson. You can find anything, but we serve it up. That's the big picture. But where we're really able to get this in the hands, right content, right time, right stage, is in Salesforce. You saw some of this demoed this morning. We just, Lisa, went through a major overhaul. We've been doing this for a while, but she did a big overhaul, working with product marketing to refresh and upgrade that experience of guided selling that's inside of our Salesforce. New meta tagging, all of it. It's a key component because then they'll go out to the portal and look for something, but the critical stuff that we've identified is just right there for them in Salesforce. Or Salesforce which you can notice I use Saleshood and Salesforce to get interchangeably. They kind of are in our world at this point. But those are the two biggest areas I would say that we are still able to have impact on reps that are proficient or see themselves as proficient. Last thing I want to hit, and then we'll do questions, is um, how are you measuring it, right? People are going to talk about that today. I just want to go at a high level. Beyond KPIs, we do use conversational intelligence. We happen to use Chorus. There's a lot of amazing analytics and, and uh, lagging indicators that we get from Chorus to know if people are adapting the ways that we're teaching them to pitch and sell and all of that. Um, I want to talk quickly about the balanced scorecard. I don't have it. Um, the balanced scorecard is part of the strategy mapping methodology. How do you take a strategy for 18 to 24 months and bring it down to the street level so something actually gets done? So often, strategies are rolled out six months later, nobody knows what they are. If you want to know more about this, I'd love to talk to you about it. But this is how we measure by quarters and by halves how we are impacting those strategy elements and we're making progress. I've already alluded to this. This is, uh, thank you, Justin, for this uh, great animated correlations dashboard. But this, to me, is the holy grail, my personal enablement journey. When I was at Vonage, we used another product, and the CEO is a friend of mine, and we were at edge case for them, and he devoted all kinds of dev resources to it, and they still couldn't do what I needed them to do. I got it out of the box now, and I'm very, very, well, sort of out of the box. We had to build it, but very excited about that. And I'll just end on this. Some of you in here are enablement leaders. You may be aspiring to be enablement leaders. And just a couple of things that I found in my career that I'll share, and then I'll take a couple questions.